hearing from the leaders of Arizona's political parties about the election. Oh, the Republican Party fared extremely well here in Arizona. Well, I would uh, define our state as blue. What to expect from Arizona's recreational marijuana measure. One of the most important things for people to remember is that laws take a little while to get implemented. And analysis on the outcome of key races in Southern Arizona. I think there's a lot of voting Democratic down the ballot in light of the presidential election. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivetta. Thanks for joining us. More than a week after polls closed, the race to count every ballot continued in Arizona, even after victories in other states gave Joe Biden enough electoral college votes to take the White House. On election night in Arizona, Democrats at the top of the ticket claimed early leads. Very humbled to be here. And I'm also uh, confident that when the votes are counted, that we're gonna be successful in this mission. They remained ahead even as counting in the days that followed narrowed the gap. But the results also showed a much speculated blue wave failed to flip other federal and legislative seats down ballot. Instead, all congressional incumbents won re-election and Republicans retained control of the state capitol. Following the outcomes closely are the chairs of the Arizona Democratic and Republican parties. We spoke to both this week. We believe in faith, family and freedom. Beginning with Republican chair Kelly Ward, whose party joined the Trump campaign and the Republican National Committee in a lawsuit challenging the results in Maricopa County. Ward told us she believes President Trump could still win in Arizona and blames the media for declaring Joe Biden the next president elect. You and I are speaking more than a week after the election. As we know, there's litigation, not just in Arizona, but in other states here. Uh, there are some people who say it's over. You say it's not. Oh, definitely it's not. Not one state has certified an election as of the time of this election, this uh, interview. Not one has actually certified. So the only people who have called the election are the media. And as we all know, there is nowhere in the Constitution that the mainstream media calls elections. So at this point, we do not have a president elect in our country, and it's very disingenuous and potentially dangerous for the media to do what they've done. In other races, uh, the Republican Party did probably not fare as well as you had hoped. What do you attribute that to? Oh, the Republican Party fared extremely well here in Arizona, um, uh, a red wave across the board. Uh, we maintained control of the Arizona state legislature on the Senate and the House side, uh, maintaining Republican control of the Corporation Commission, maintaining Republican control of the uh, Board of Supervisors in Maricopa County, the biggest county. Uh, it is a good day for Republicans. And that's why it's so surprising to see the results that have been pushed upon us by the media about President Trump and even about Senator McSally. I know that you've been doing politics a long time now. What are you doing as far as strategy as you look forward to the near future? Because the Senate will be uh, another talker here in 2022. Well, as we know, you know, it's a two year race. And uh, should Senator McSally not be victorious in this race, we have plenty of Republicans who are ready to go to take that seat from uh, the Democrats should he be crowned the victor in this particular instance. We've got a very, very strong bench of people who care about faith, family, and freedom, who care about small government, low taxes, personal responsibility, and the Constitution. So I look forward to 2022 when we have that Senate race and we have our statewide races for governor, for secretary of state, and beyond. I'm glad you mentioned governor because that will be a race, of course, the Senate. Any names that we can look out for? Uh, you know, I would just say keep your eyes open. We've got to get through this election first, and then we will start to look forward to 2022. Here in Pima County, the race for sheriff also very close. Um, in our supervisors, uh, Steve Christie, the lone Republican, it looks like at this point, he actually said he thinks the Republican Party maybe needs to take a, a moment and reflect and, and come up with an idea about how to move forward. What do you say? I think the Republican Party is moving in exactly the right direction, even in deep blue Pima County. If you look at the number of precinct committee men that were elected in 2018, there were 196 in 2018. There are 349 that were elected in 2020. Things are moving in the right direction because Republicans want strong people who stand up for our platform and what we stand for. Things like 
freedom of speech and freedom of religion, things like our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms to protect ourselves and our family, our right to privacy, um, the, the uh, drive to keep taxes low, to keep more money in the pockets of individuals rather in government than in government coffers. So the Republican Party is very squared away and we are making inroads in Pima County and across Arizona and across the nation. There are some high profile Republicans who maybe don't align as Republicans or conservatives, depending on which race you're looking at. They say that the party's fractured. Do you agree with them? Uh, there are a few outliers that say that they are Republicans, uh, but they can't tell us what policies they are unhappy with in the Republican Party, in our platform or that are being implemented that help Arizonans and help Americans across the board, regardless of their political affiliation. Many of them are concerned about personality. I personally, and most of the Republicans, the vast majority of Republicans that I know are concerned about policy because policy is what is implemented so that we can govern for the good of all people. Chairwoman, you sound geared up and ready to go and not upset about the 2020 election results. Am I reading you correctly? You are, because we are fighting. I've had some people on Twitter say, why don't you just be a gracious loser? I will tell you that um, I will be gracious. I'll be gracious in the dining room. But in this fight, I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior for Republicans. I'm a warrior for election integrity. And I'm still a warrior for President Donald J. Trump. All right, Chairwoman Kelly War, thank you for your time. We'll see you again soon. All right, bye-bye. A few days after speaking to Ward, we posed similar questions to Arizona Democratic Party Chair Felicia Rodolini about takeaways from the election and the party's path forward. All right, so here we are a week after the election. How would you rate the performance of Democrats in Arizona? Well, I would uh, define our state as blue. We have two U.S. senators uh, from the Democratic Party. That hasn't happened in over 60 years. We've sent our electoral college votes to uh, the Biden-Harris team. We picked up another corporation commission seat. Uh, we maintained our position in our state house and we gained a, a really blue uh, flip in uh, LD28. Uh, I would say our performance uh, is great. All right, now earlier this week, I spoke with your counterpart in the Republican side of things, and she said this race is not over. The Senate race is still up for grabs. The presidential, uh, as you know, there's ongoing litigation about the state of Arizona. So how do you see that moving forward here in the next few weeks? Is it over? Well, these lawsuits that have been filed, you need facts and you need evidence. And we believe that these lawsuits are based upon conspiracy theories, falsehoods, they need to go through the legal process, but at the end of the day, uh, the vote count was solid, orderly, legal, and we're going to be on the winner's circle. Let's talk about these shades of blue, because depending on which media you are consuming, uh, there's a conversation. Is it purple? Is it light? As you know, in some rural parts of Arizona, the conservative stronghold still holds. So how do you see that sort of unraveling here over the next couple of years as you look toward another election? Well, I want to start with what we gained in 2018 and how we have maintained those gains in 2020. Sure, we had a very, very aggressive strategic program to flip historically red seats up and down the ballot. Um, we were successful in some, we weren't successful in others. We just need to look at the data. We need to analyze uh, the things we did well, look at the opportunities, and then launch that into our 2022 campaign, which will be equally as aggressive. Where are some of the areas that you think the party fell short? Well, I can tell you that in a presidential year, there's over a million more voters. And we knew as a battleground state that the Republican would work, Republicans would work very hard to maintain their advantage, uh, and we had to work even harder. We believe that we picked up a lot of votes in the rural counties because we were really organizing there. We lost in terms of majority vote from a lot of our rural counties, but we are gonna to continue to organize and we know the momentum is in our favor from 2018 and 2020. Um, we have we held on to our congressional majority that we picked up in 2018. We still have five, four majority in our Congress and that will continue as well. 
how do you do that? How do you convince some longtime conservative Republicans that this Democratic Party, I don't know if it's a new party or if it's being rebranded, but how do you convince them that this party might be for them? Well, you look at what happened in 2020. Joe Biden and Mark Kelly built a coalition of supporters from all walks of life, people of faith, people of conscience, Republicans, Democrats, and independents. And they voted for our Democratic candidates because we're the ones talking about values, the values that all Arizonans care about. And we're the, also the candidates in the party that are going to roll up our sleeves, get to business, and really solve the problems that uh, are facing everyone today. At the state level, Republicans still hold the majority in the House and Senate when um, 21, which is right around the corner here in January. Uh, how do you see that sort of uh, challenging the Democrats who are in the state legislature and who would like to craft policy? Well, I saw a difference in the 2018 legislative session uh, when you compare it to the 2020. We gained so much in 2018 that Democrats and Republicans did work together in 2020 um, for more bipartisan policies and legislation. With our gain of another seat in the state Senate, Legislative District 28, um, Republicans are going to have to work with the Democrats. Um, and I believe that will be an advantage that um, will be beneficial to the entire state. All right, Felicia Rodolini, Chairwoman of the Arizona Democratic Party, thank you. Thank you. Arizona was one of several states this election cycle where voters passed measures to legalize recreational marijuana. Proposition 207, or the Safe and Secure Act, allows for recreational use and sales. It comes a decade after medical marijuana became legal in the state. Tony Paniagua reports on some of the next steps as the law takes effect. As soon as it appeared that voters approved Prop 207, the increase began in earnest at the downtown dispensary in Tucson. We were inundated with calls the day after the proposition passed. So um, we're excited about that, but we can't serve them uh, yet. I think people are like, oh my gosh, yay, now is the time. And unfortunately it isn't. What do you, what do you think the right price point is? Mo Asnani opened his company with a business partner after voters approved medical marijuana in 2010. We opened in August of 2013. Uh, we started with, you know, three employees, and today, between our three locations, we employ over 130 people. Like others in this industry, the downtown dispensary supported Prop 207, the use of recreational marijuana for residents who are 21 or older, although many policies moving forward will have to be ironed out. Among other details, the Arizona Department of Health Services still has to adopt the rules to implement and regulate recreational marijuana and determine who will be able to supply it and sell it. The department is scheduled to accept applications from interested sellers from January 19th until March 9th of next year. One of the most important things for people to remember is that laws take a little while to get implemented. So we're really looking at early, probably March, April of 2021, by the time you can come in and buy 21 and over. Rules around recreational marijuana will also differ from medical marijuana. Taryn Remy is the manager of a medical marijuana certification business in Midtown Tucson. The company also has other locations across the state. So many legalities that they have to sort out when it comes down to cultivation, um, selling it in certain states and cities. Uh, they have medical and recreational sold at the same place. Um, some they have medical take priority rather than recreational being sold. And then some can't sell in the same location as recreational. So that still has to be sorted out of what dispensaries and who can sell at that point. Arizona medical marijuana cards are permitted for residents 18 years and older with conditions like cancer, glaucoma, or chronic pain. The card is good for two years and costs $150 in state fees, plus $150 in office fees at this facility. More than 250,000 Arizonans have registered for a medical marijuana card, and having one will let holders avoid additional taxes that will be levied on recreational sales. Let's say you spend $100 on your recreational um, cannabis. You will then most likely pay $124.50. So you're additionally adding $20 to $30 more on, on your cannabis. Also, the amounts you can obtain will differ. 
Something like this here, uh, the tipsy turtle, they have a chocolate covered pretzel stick. Um, it's 100 milligrams for the whole bag. Each pretzel is 10 milligrams. That's what you could expect as a recreational patient. Um, anything outside of 100 milligrams in a bag would not be something that you'd be able to purchase. And for as an example, you have something next to the pretzels? Yes, this is the Indica PM. Um, it is a 300 milligram product. So each piece in there is 15 milligrams. So this would be something that only a medicinal patient could purchase, not something a recreational patient would be able to purchase. I have uh, a father-in-law that what, had brain cancer, um, and his dosing was over 800 milligrams throughout the day through an edible amount, through gummies. And that was throughout the day around the clock. And so 100 milligrams just doesn't touch what's needed. Even though the new law is not expected to be implemented for a few months, it's already having an impact in the state. Prosecutors in Maricopa and Pima counties where the majority of residents live, both said recently they will drop or dismiss pending possession charges for small amounts of marijuana. We absolutely supported Prop 207 for multiple reasons. One is that it's access for a lot of people who couldn't afford the card, didn't want to be on a, um, you know, a list, um, so to say. And also, I think the biggest reason is that it decriminalizes you know, small amounts. And we have seen incarceration in this state at such a high level for marijuana over the years. So we're seeing an immediate effect um, you know, from Prop 207 and decriminalization. Election results in Pima County resemble the closest thing to a blue wave in Arizona. Democrats extended their reach by claiming an additional seat on the Board of Supervisors, ousting the county's Republican treasurer and putting Chris Nanos ahead of Mark Napier in the tight race for sheriff. For analysis, I'm joined by the Green Valley News, Sahuarita Suns, Dan Shear, and 1030 KVOI AM Tipping Point host, Zach Yenser. My thanks to both of you for being here today. All right, let's start off with the sheriff race. Um, Dan, I know you've been covering this pretty extensively. At this point, it's Thursday morning. We're talking it does not look like a recount. So is Chris Nanos about to be the new sheriff in town? It sure looks like it, unless things break very heavy for uh, Mark Napier, it looks like Chris Nanos will be back in the position. And uh, he and I spoke a few years ago when he was about to leave, and he said probably his biggest mistake was that he kept the same team in from Clarence Dupnik, and he should have just brought in his own people. So now with it going from a Republican to a Democrat, we expect some changes, but I think that'll be on his mind, is that he wants his team in there to do what he wants to uh, get accomplished. So we'll see if he does it. Zach, how did this happen? I mean, he was not endorsed by the local newspaper. I mean, if you listen to the radio or if you were on social media, it looked like Mark Napier was going to win pretty easily. Yeah, Lorraine, you hit on one thing that really confused me is that the Democratic establishment, by and large, in Pima County did not go very public for, for Nanos. If you look at who endorsed who, he was often off the list. And that always puzzled me a little bit. I I've asked people, I've put my ear to the tracks and said, what happened here? And the best answer I've gotten, Lorraine, is that this was a situation where I think there was a lot of voting Democratic down the ballot in light of the presidential election. And Lorraine, it was a tumultuous 2016 year for Nanos. And it's, it's amazing to me that I think the voters either forgot that or overlooked it uh, four years later. And I can only say it's got to be down the ballot voting uh, all Ds for so many voters in Pima County. All right, Dan, you were on the program a couple weeks ago. You talked about how the Pima County Board of Supervisors would remain much of the same as it has been in the last 400 years, though let's be honest, none of us were here for that. Um, Matt Hines is a new voice on that seat. He is a physician. How do you see him uh, coming in and, and maybe shaking things up? You know, I think the only way he's gonna shake things up is that he's gonna make the conversation a lot more interesting. But I think at the end of the day, we're probably going to see a lot of 4-1 votes with Steve Christie, the lone Republican, being on that, uh, on that lopsided end. But I do hope that Matt Hines brings in a little more uh, pragmatism, some common sense, some uh, open mind to some of the, the issues that the county is facing. Uh, then the question would be, but who would be the third vote? Uh, and so that's why I don't see a lot of things changing other than, again, I think that the meetings will be a little bit more, more interesting. Zach, let's say it wasn't so partisan. I mean, does Steve Christie have the ability to craft any sort of policy here in Pima County that could go up against the Democrats where they say, you know what, let's just do what's best for Pima County, not look at this as D versus R? 
know, I think Steve Christie has the ability to do that. His background as a business person in Southern Arizona, I think he represents his, his district well in that sense. It was a tighter race, maybe between him and Steve Diamond than, than many expected. In fact, the, the night of the election, I, I think a lot of people thought that he was going to lose that seat as well. We might have a 5 0 board uh, of supervisors, five Democrats, no Republicans, but he, he pulled it out in the end. And I think his voice is helpful. You know, I think Matt Hines was catapulted into the seat because of his background in public health and as a, as a doctor. I think having Steve Christie's voice as uh, someone who is at least talking about the impacts of COVID recovery and economic recovery on business is going to be helpful. And um, I also do see, though, potentially his voice becoming stronger out of necessity, maybe becoming a little bit less pragmatic, just out of necessity, being the only Republican. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. I'm not quite sure how to read it yet. All right, let's move on to marijuana is legal in Arizona. There will be a new tax hike. What happened to this Republican conservative stronghold that once was Arizona? Zach, let's start with you. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And there's a lot of uh, my friends who are on the left side of the spectrum who who think that this is a temporary blue shift, that this may not be something that is permanent. It's kind of my gauge on Prop 207 was that it was a much more improved version of what we saw back in 2016, that it solved a lot of the problems uh, that, uh, that 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 version of the proposition on the ballot back then had in it. Uh, I think that in light of some of the social justice issues uh, and the impact uh, marijuana charges have on that, I think was one element. Um, I think that uh, growing a bit of a, of a tax base in that way was another. I also always felt the no on 207 just had the weaker argument. Uh, didn't have uh, a strong enough pull for voters to get behind it. I thought that the yes on 207 was more clear and more engaging. And I think to some level, it came down to those three things for me. Well, the yes on 207 had all the funding and that's what uh, drove it. And those are the people who are going to be making all the money off of us. And we'll, I think we're going to see some very devastating circumstances as a result of this. But I think voters went for it largely because they've seen several other states do it and they haven't seen anything out of there that has been overwhelmingly negative, uh, even though there really have been. And, and it's, I think it's a sad day when we have to fund uh, through pot uh, what we want to get done in this state, and it's and it's really too bad. So what is next? I am glad that a lot of the uh, laws were dealt with through this proposition. I think that that's a very uh, uh, a positive thing. Uh, but I wish that the whole thing had just gone through the legislature because then it would be easier to make fixes on the run rather than overturning a proposition, which would be very very difficult. All right. Zach, let's move on to the Senate race. At this point, it looks like, I mean, Mark Kelly's already in Washington, D.C., getting oriented in the process of becoming the new senator. Martha McSally, at this point on Thursday, has not conceded the race. What's the significance of having yet another person from southern Arizona to represent the state in the Senate? Yes, I mean, it is significant. And I think there are two things that stand out to me. Underneath all the campaigning that Martha McSally did uh, to in her Senate races, and as a senator, more importantly, I think a lot of people forget that uh, many of the legislative items that she pushed through in the Senate were very locally beneficial. Udall Park, um, some of the, the water legislation. There was a lot that was done for Tucson that nobody really talks about. And so I would certainly hope uh, that having uh, Mark Kelly now as a senator, that his legislation will not just even focus statewide or nationally, uh, but will have local benefit like we saw with his predecessor. The other thing I think that stands out to me, maybe a story that doesn't get talked about enough, is I've been talking about Tucson as a Southwest hub for space tech. We've seen Vector restart this week. Uh, of course, worldview was a huge element of the campaign, both positive and negative. So many uh, uh, space missions that are done in partnership between the U of A and, and, uh, and NASA. We really have a potential to grow our brand in Southern Arizona as a space exploration and space technology hub. And I think in that sense, politics aside, having a senator with that background representing Tucson, I think has some really intriguing opportunities for us here in Southern Arizona. Well, he, he's, a, he's a spaceman. That'll probably help. But we have to remember two things. One, that 5 million 
of Arizona's 7 million residents live in the Phoenix area, and this man is up for re-election in two years. That's where his focus is going to be. I hope to have some benefit down here, but really he's not a Southern Arizonan. His wife is, and any history he may have on the area certainly came from her and it would be rich and meaningful, but pretty much he doesn't. So I think he's going to be focusing on the Phoenix area because of the population. We would fully expect that. I get it. I'm not seeing too many benefits of him having a house in Pima County. All right. It remains to be seen. My thanks to Zach Yenser from KVOI, The Tipping Point, and Dan Shear from the Green Valley News, Salvadita Sun. Thank you. Amid a tumultuous election season, this week our nation took time to honor veterans. The pandemic led to canceled parades and scaled down events, but it did not hamper tradition at the Arizona Veterans Memorial Cemetery in Marana. There we met retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Ken Robinson as he and others planted flags on each grave. Let's see, we've got over 2,300 individuals here. It's going to take quite a few hours today. Yeah, another Air Force. These individuals that are buried here have got great stories that we can't hear about right now. What we can do is reach out to other veterans and hopefully capture their history, their story, what they did in the military. Yeah, it was a staff sergeant. Seventh Vietnam. It's got to be one of my brothers. I served in Vietnam. And then that over here means that's the Gulf War. They got an Air Force Master Sergeant. Ah, my dad was a Master Sergeant in the Air Force, so yeah. Wow. Yes, maybe. But I grew up with that idea, obligation, and I started to love my country. I loved my obligation. I would have been a failure in my mother's eyes if I hadn't done this. Here in the U.S., we're free. A lot of places, no. You know, it's, it's, it's a solemn honor to consider what our former veterans has gone through. If you want to support beautification efforts at the cemetery, we have information about how on our website. And that's all for now. Thanks so much for joining us. To get in touch, visit us on social media or send an email to Arizona360 at azpm.org and let us know what you think. We'll see you next week.